Hello and welcome to Policy Voices by Friends of Europe, an independent think tank with a difference. Each week from Brussels, we bring you powerful conversations with policy voices from around the world. Policy Voices talking policy choices. And it goes really deep. Like, it's not superficial. People start together, you know, by our um, moderation and facilitation to really start looking at things differently, even though they have a clear perspective or position about it, not normally. But most people don't question things like with the letter, uh, with the word why. Why would I do it? Why didn't I do anything else? Hello and welcome to Policy Voices, Friends of Europe's weekly podcast on European and global affairs. I'm your host, Katarina Villanova. With its history, surely Germany would be more immune to the far-right movement, but this is clearly not the case. That's why I spoke to Christina Kromer and Dario De La Rosa from Metropolis. Born in Dresden and expanded to Leipzig, Metropolis realized that the tram was the perfect place to kickstart conversations about people's problems, and why not climate change and the return to dictatorship as well. Christine and Dario have been doing this work for a few years now, and they tell how they notice a change in the discourse of the people they encounter on the trams, but also how all it takes sometimes is to spend a few minutes with someone to get to the bottom of the issue. So stay on that side to hear my conversation with Christine Kromen and Dario de la Rosa from Metropolis. Hello, Christina, joining us today from Dresden, and Dario joining us today from Leipzig. How are you this afternoon? And welcome to Policy Voices. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm feeling good, and I guess I'm really hopeful about the conversation of today. Yes, me too. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me this afternoon. And today I'm really happy to have you both here uh, for the second episode of our Far Right uh, special series that we are dedicating uh, here at Policy Voices. And for this second episode, we wanted to focus on Germany, uh, almost as a case study, let's say. And it's really great to be able to speak with you. Uh, you're both working for, for Metropolis. You, Christine, you, you founded Metropolis and that you're joining, uh, you started it uh, then in Leipzig. So maybe just to start, Christina, how would you define Metropolis and what is it that you do? Uh, so could you give us like a short introduction? The idea of Metropolis is um, is being already put together in the to... name Metro, which stands, of course, you know, French for Metropolitan, or Tram and Polis, the ancient Greek society where all topics concerning the people were discussed in the Agora. And um, these two things come together in Metropolis and we see the Agora of our time oh, in the trams and trains that pe people use every day and gather there and being just there, not doing anything really because it's not a place to do something that you would do in your normal uh, daily life. You cannot plant the garden, you cannot repair your car. You're just waiting from, uh, you know, until you have arrived where you want to arrive and you cannot leave in between. So you are sort of confined to a certain space that you have to share with others. And that's really the moment that we use and see as a potential to uh, have a dynamic agora uh, where we can be quiet uh, and stand, you know, in, in silence next to each other or sit next to each other. Or we could just turn around to the other person and say, hello, how are you doing? And what do you think to <laughs> about that? What do you feel? What's your opinion? And how could we make things better instead of letting it just, you know, making it worse? I absolutely love your approach and how you find and how, are you able to find this one time in, uh, in our daily commute if you live in the city and if you use a public transportation, why not take that as an opportunity to speak with people? So let's say, for example, I'm in Dresden or I'm in Leipzig and I enter the tram. Uh, what can I expect? Uh, how do you go about in, uh, you know, in your approach to, to speaking to people? How do you organize yourselves? Let's say I, I go in a tram in Dresden and you, you guys are there. Uh, what will I see? What will I do? 
Um, we are usually a team of uh, three or four people, and we have uh, we use the back part of the of the trunk as our conversation living room. We like to call it uh, like that to have just a more pleasant uh, vibe to it. And so we have uh, two people which are sitting there and moderating this um, conversation, and one person which is going to work through the tram and try to invite people to participate in in our project. So I would uh, approach you and tell you that uh, we are having this, this uh, speaking project is happening today at this uh, tram. I will tell you which uh, topic we are talking talking about. Let's say it's about Europe, and I would invite you to to come to sit uh, by our side to engage in a conversation with uh, our uh, people from the moderation and with other people which are also traveling by by tram and. In the best ways of possible, you will sit with uh, two or three other passengers and have a conversation about uh, this topic, um, in which we have uh, presented you already. And what are you just said? Uh, for example, you could invite me to talk about Europe. Um, that that's a very big topic. How how do you go about choosing the topics uh, that you're going to talk about that day in the tram? When, what are some other examples of things that you that you talk about? When we started Metropolis, we didn't know what what happened. We didn't know what to expect, and we clearly didn't have any idea what's important for the people. We had some assumptions, but it's always better to really talk to the people and to find out what they what's really on their minds. So we started saying, okay, what does move you in these times? That's interesting for us. And we had a whole bunch and broad variety of topics that we could choose from. Um, and then people started, you know, we had a conversation, like we had a discussion group of three people and everybody had a different topic, you know. Some were just going to school and doing the A-levels, others were unemployed and the third took care of her mother, you know, who was 90 years so and that was really difficult to harmonize in a way which topic is most important now and where can everybody join in and so when we developed this mere conversation project to uh outreach democracy work as we call it now we getting in touch with uh administration and the municipality of Dresden and Leipzig and um, at the moment with the Ministry of Sex and Lady, and they provide us with topics that are interesting for them and also interesting for the society, of course, because we are all in this together. And if there's, for example, a topic like flight and asylum, then it's interesting for politics as well as interesting for society. And so we get the idea and what's important for politics. We hear that from, you know, the mayor, for example, of Dresden, and we take it back to the people and say, look, this is what we've, we've been, um, in cooperation with. And this is the idea that we get together and talk about your experience and what, how you would like things to go and what could be done better, not what can be done worse. We are looking only strictly for ideas that make things better we we are looking for good ideas and good experience best practice have to build on from that's great so in that sense you're almost like the a moderator a middle agent between the citizens and the local levels of government what have been some of the ideas uh that you that you've collected from these interactions that you have on the tram with the citizens that you then took to the local levels of government? And have you seen any change in practice? Uh, since they are the ones asking for it as well, uh, have you seen any any change already? Not yet. They are just, it's only been a couple of months since we're doing this now. And it's really interesting because when it's really broad, like the topic is enormously broad, for example, climate change, then it's People have a lot of ideas and a lot of experiences, but they don't have things that could really be done in everyday life. So it does mean you have to do a lot of to make the question smaller so that people really have the opportunity to, to come up with ideas that could be put in place and into action 
in Dresden from the mayor, for example, for um, climate. And that, can you tell me how do people receive when uh, when they walk in the tram on their way to school, to work, to meet friends, family, and then they're approached by you saying, hey, we're today talking about this and that. Uh, do you feel like they are receptive and they want to join? Do you feel like it's a, a certain profile of people that are somehow more attuned to speak on on certain topics? Uh, how has that how has that how has been that experience for you so far? It really depends on the on the day. Some days we have the feeling that it also depends on the weather. If you have a good weather, the people are more active to to be being, being approached and happier, and maybe have a another attitude but um i would say we have a lot of uh, young people and students which uh, are really interested in this topic but uh, for projects like uh, ours you always ask you yourself the question how do i approach the people which don't want to participate and that's why we are sitting at the at the tram because everybody's there and we can approach the the people and try and invite them so it depends on the topic how many people we we engage And it depends also how personally you engage the people. If I ask someone, can you solve the big questions of humanity, of society? No one is going to answer and everyone is going to think I'm, I'm too too small to have an answer for, for that question. But if we ask really the people, uh, we're interested in, in knowing what's your life experience on this topic. So everyone can start and engage with that. And that's what, uh, what we try to do. And Most of the time it works. Uh, we often maybe with the topics where every four or fifth uh, passenger is going being engaged in a conversation or sometimes every eight or tenth passenger, which is uh, still for a whole year is a lot of people which are participating with uh, our project. So if I understand correctly, your role is mostly to be moderators, to be moderating a conversation, to be asking questions. So can you tell me a bit more, how, which, what is the approach that you take when being there, when, uh, you know, for example, you mentioned climate change. It's, it's a topic where, in which people have very strong opinions about it. How, how do you go about it in, uh, in moderating these conversations, the kind of questions you ask as well? Yeah, we don't really try to educate people or to have a factual discussion with them because we understand ourselves as neutral part in the, in the conversation. And we try that other passengers engage in this conversation so that they can uh, learn from each other. Because um, at the end, every opinion that someone has resides, even if it's not a um, factual truth, uh, resides in someone something they have been observing in the last years or for them or for their life. So we want to, to know why is it so that people have this opinion or, or the other one without teaching them what the truth is, but uh, more trying to help them to ask themselves questions so they can uh, get to the truth of their own statements or to the falseness of their own statements. In no way can we try to educate people. If they see that and they have really good um, focus on if people come over as a sort of visionary and then it's over before it's started. Um, what we do is never, we, we hear people's opinions and then we say yeah and if it's extreme opinions it's especially important to say why does this for example people want dictatorship back back sometimes you know in dresden that's a position which you can hear more often over the years then we say okay that's interesting can you please explain why dict dictatorship would your life make more easier or happier or enriched content what what's the what's the point what's the how, how would it make things better and please explain thoroughly in and in, in detail so that i don't understand you superficially but on a deeper level and people start but they they don't start because they start thinking and after that you they slowly start to explain why what they choose dictatorship over democracy And it ends very soon because they try to choose a strategy they've heard about, for example, from their grandparents, that life had been better because it had been, for example, they had better 
contact to communities or they were together as a family and they try to adapt it to the situation now nowadays and they um, connect it with strong positions that doesn't make any sense for them but they have to first see why it wouldn't make any sense and that's the long sort of inner process and we sort of started when we come across extreme positions we really want to understand what would it help what would it make it better and are there any others that's what we come after that we come to after that isn't there any other possibility of making things better can we not find together better solutions that would help all of us or most of us to have a you know a, a life that's living up to the potential what I'm thinking here is how do you have the time to go into so much detail? You're, ta you're tackling big questions and almost existential questions. And if you, again, keeping in mind that this is all happening while people are in the tram, you know, on their daily commutes, you know, going after work, just wanted to go home maybe, you know, how do you have the time and how can you engage people in, uh, you know, talking about climate change, talking about you know, the return to dictatorship. Um, how do you how do you find the time to to do all that? We have the time because people stay with us on the tram, not really for a short amount of time, but sometimes for 30, 45 minutes or an hour or one and a half hours. And when they see this, it's like a, a reward for them. They come across or they have the feeling of being able to speak out about things that they've never been spoken about. One came up to us and said, yeah, well, uh, the topic was flight and asylum. And he said, yeah, but I'm a racist. And we said, oh, that's interesting. How did it come to this point? And he said, yeah, but are you from the, you know, this um, right wing party that we have? Because they're the only ones who would talk to me nowadays. Nobody else does. And he came straight to the point of what's really been bothering him nowadays. And so they, we don't spend small talk time. We just go straight to the core of the problem and say, yeah, okay, but why? And what does it help? And explain please to me what makes it better. And then people, yeah, they are really quick because things are really here. Like they are up to the, you know, they have, they're full of it and they just explode by telling you things they would never tell anybody. And we had an, another thing, another little story that was really touching. We had um, uh, two gender roles and how, how things have changed between men and women. And she was sitting there that lady that took part and she had cancer. And uh, she's surrounded by men in her family, like her husband and she has um, children like sons and they wouldn't talk to her about this that she has cancer and nobody shows any feelings towards her and she's all alone in her situation and she started crying and she was sitting with us for 30 minutes just crying away all the time and keep on talking about this experience of being so alone in the situation because it's a male behavior not to not to show any feelings and not to have any words for feelings and so she stayed with us until the very last uh, last station and had sort of like a different approach like a different perspective um talking about this what she experienced every day at home and it goes really deep like it's not superficial people start together you know by our um, moderation and facilitation to really start looking at things differently, even though they have a clear perspective or position about it, not normally, but most people don't question things like with the letter, uh, with the word, why, why would I do it? Why didn't I do anything else? And that's what we come in. And what about you, Dari? Would you have any, you know, interactions in, in the two years that you've been, uh, that you've been doing this moderations, facilitations? Uh, any interactions that uh, stick out for you the most? There was one time, a man, and at the start of the conversation, we started speaking about neighborhood and everything. And then mm, in the end, it became everything a little bit more, more political because he was telling me about immigrants from, from abroad 
which were living uh, nearby his his place and that he wouldn't um he didn't like them so i understood he was uh, coming a little from from the far right that uh, he was a potential voter of the afd so oh. i didn't start and tell him it's bad that's not a, not a good opinion everything i wanted to know what what his problem was uh, was bothering him so in the end it was the fact that uh, he didn't like to know that immigrants which uh, are seeking for asylum are not working in in germany but he didn't know that they cannot work because the German government doesn't give them permission to, to work. So I started just uh, telling him about this uh, this permission. And I could really observe uh, how his opinion about these people will change through our conversation. Because at the end he was, well, if they want to work, why don't we help them to, to find a work? There's a, a lot of things to do in Germany. We need a lot of workers. Uh, why are we not helping them to to find the work and everything. For me, it was somehow thought, uh, taught me a lesson to just wait and let conversation live a little bit. So to see where can you end. And he he started like at the first point, you could think this is a racist. And at the end, it's just uh, one person which doesn't know all the facts. So it was a, a situation which uh, has marked me a, a lot from, from this work. Considering that you've been doing this work for a few years now, it, we can almost say that you can see a, a before and after. Uh, we started seeing the, the rise of the far right. In Germany, uh, it has been really accentuated in the past year or so. Did you notice a difference when you started seeing AFD members being elected in uh, local governments or in the Bundestag? And perhaps the normalization of their of their rhetoric. I think the example you just gave, Dario, of how, you know, so, so many times these narratives and this the, these things we heard, we hear about migrants and refugees at the end are just not based in facts. So I think what I'm trying to, to, to get at here is that the, the, could you notice the difference uh, from what we see at the political level with the, the members of the Bundestag being elected of the far right and then the kind of conversations and the kind of comments that you hear being on the tram every day? I personally noticed a big difference uh, before and after Corona happened uh, because that was the first time for many uh, to become politically engaged and really go for demonstration and try to say, but I'm not happy with staying at home and, you know, having vaccinations and all that. And so we come into the tram and we have... Uh, we encounter a lot of people saying, I have been now uh, politically active and it didn't help anything. I couldn't see any change of politics that I wanted. And so I'm not engaging here anymore because you will see it's worth nothing. And that really, ah, that's a great pity because we are trying to, you know, have a like broader, deeper interchange of perspectives and become like a communication um, tool for society and government or you know administration and politics so that they can exchange opinions and you know what they are planning on doing with uh, society and society could give you know feedback about what the how they would see it and that the people are now saying we don't want it anymore that's really a problem. And do you think that these citizens that have somehow given up on mainstream parties, do you see that they are being uh, captivated by, by the far right? Did you see this happening? Completely. It's so, and it's, uh, you know, it's overall, it's not just a bit. They take up like a whole a view to the world in general. It's like mm, every topic they don't differentiate anymore and see, well, I'm here uh, against something that the party says and um, for something the party says it's like all yeah that's all okay and all right in the end as long as it's like a protest against what's there uh, like political parties like established political parties more democratic parties that's all rubbish and we have to tell them that's all rubbish and the discourse is really so it doesn't know any boundaries anymore you know of respect and stuff so you really need, need to get through to a person behind all that political, I have to say, rubbish, you know, behind all that attitudes and positions to really get to the people and say, ah, now I understand why you would do things the way you do or proclaim things the way you say it. 
but it takes a lot of time and people are much more unwilling to take part in this kind of journey with you. Yeah, and they are afraid of the right-wing movement and um, process that German society has taken and been now quite some years. But they say, yeah, but I'm going to vote for them anyway because I want to change no matter what's happened afterwards. And so it's like, wow, okay, then what, what, why? And they sometimes don't even bother with the answer because they don't bother. And this kind of, it's all the same to us. It's really fundamental and central by now. Christina, Dario, thank you so much. Thanks too. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying on that side to listen to my conversation with Cristina Cromer and Dario De La Rosa from Metropolis. Stay tuned next week for the third and last episode of the series on the rise of the far right in Europe. In the meantime, we would love to hear what you thought of today's episode. You can search for Friends of Europe on LinkedIn and X or send us an email. Our address is press at friendsofeurope.org. As always, don't forget to subscribe to Friends of Europe's podcast wherever you get your podcast to never miss an episode of Policy Voices. I'm Katarina Villanova and I will be with you again next week. Until then, goodbye.